Praise the Lord and welcome to Acts, I Will Build My Church, lesson number 21, part two. Last week's lesson had a whole lot of content in it, so I decided to break it up into two parts, just so we wouldn't have to really rush through it. So today we're going to be doing part two of lesson 21. And God bless each and every one of you. I love you all. I miss seeing you. Hope you are all doing well. And I just love it. It just stays in my mind uh, what the pastor said and Brother Dwayne even said it on Sunday. Stay safe and saved. I love that. So I hope all of y'all are saying safe and saved. So anyway, last week we ended up by talking about Paul preaching all night long in the upper chamber and how that there was a man named Eutychus that was sitting in a window and he fell asleep. And when he fell asleep, he ended up falling out of the window. They're about three stories up. He fell and he died. And then Paul, he just went down. It said he went down to him, embracing him and said, trouble not yourselves for his life is in him. And at that point, this man came back to life. And Paul just went right back to preaching. Just like we've seen throughout the whole book of Acts, it does not spend much time talking about the miracles. Because for them, seeing a miracle was a normal thing. They knew the power of God was real. And they saw God do great works. So they didn't follow after miracles, but the miracles followed them. The miracles come because the church is preaching the right message. When the church preaches the right message and uses the right method, miracles, they just have to follow. And I challenged you last week at the very end of the lesson to look at yourself in the mirror and say what it says in Luke 18 and 8. Luke 18 and 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth. When Jesus comes, will he find you keeping the faith? During this pandemic, are you keeping the faith? Are you getting closer to Jesus or are you getting further away from Jesus? Where is your walk with Jesus? Would Jesus find you today still working for him, holding on to the faith? I hope you did that this week. hope you got real with yourself and not tried to lie and deceive your own self because this is your eternity. It's where you're going to spend eternity at. So you got to choose wisely. Like the message on Sunday, you better be there listening for your name. It is your eternity. You need to be listening for your name. So today, we're going to pick up where we left off last week after Paul preaching that all-night message in Acts chapter 20. So Acts 20, 13 through 16. And when we, and we went before to ship and sailed to Athos, there attending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when we met him at Athos, we took him in and came to Metolene, and sailed thence, and came the next day over the Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos, and tarried at Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus, for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it was possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So at this point, as we can see here, like I pointed out before, Luke must have been with him at this time, because he started off with, we went. So Paul here, he's trying his very best to get back to Jerusalem for Pentecost, because he knows it will be full of people from all over, and no doubt we know that Paul wants to preach the word of God to them. So Paul, he couldn't stay any longer in Asia because he would miss all the boat rides. It wasn't as easy today as, you know, jumping on an airplane and going. He had to get all the, make sure he timed all the boat rides just right to make it back to Jerusalem in time. So Paul then makes it to Miletus. And there, while waiting for the next ship, he decides he's going to call on the elders of Ephesus because he's waiting on the ship so he doesn't have time to make the journey on foot all the way up to Ephesus and back, you know, all the way up there, talk to them all the way back without missing his opportunity to get back to Jerusalem in time. So he's wanting the elders of Ephesus to come down and meet him. And the reason Paul wants to do this is to say goodbye to them. He wants to give them a farewell message. So this is Acts 20, 17 through 21. 
And for Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said in them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, because he spent three years with them, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with tears and temptations, which befell me by the laying of the weight of the Jews, of all the Jews that was always falling around trying to kill him, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So here Paul says something that I think is so great. He says, and how I kept nothing that was profitable unto you. Preachers, ministers that hold nothing back, that preaches the whole truth and does not sugarcoat the word down at all and hold it back because they don't want to hurt feelings or make people feel bad. That is what Paul was saying here. He was giving them everything that God gave them. Anything that God gave him, he gave it to him. He didn't sugarcoat it down. He didn't say, you know, I don't want you to feel bad. This is too tough for you. He wanted to leave them with everything they needed, everything they needed to make it to heaven. If it was profitable unto him, even just slightly, he gave it to them because making it to heaven is what mattered the most. So you should thank God when you hear a message that's being preached that is not holding anything back, a message that's stepping on your toes. That is, something, that, is, that is giving you something that is profitable to you. That's why I thank God for a pastor. He gives us everything, everything we need to make it to heaven. He does not hold nothing back. He may end up having to hear some whining and complaining when we don't like what he says, when we don't like his decisions. He's probably got to hear this complaining about it, people writing stuff on Facebook, sending messages. And, but he has to listen to what God gives him. And he's got to take what God gives him and give it to us. It might hurt us. It might hurt him giving it to us. It might step on our toes. But he's got to do what saith God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and not what saith the people. I thank God for a pastor like that. Because when I have to stand at that judgment seat, when I'm gone from this world, that I know my pastor told me everything that I needed to get through those gates. I don't have to stand there in line worrying if I'm going to get through those gates Amen. because I know my pastors told me everything from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. So it won't be my fault if I don't make it. It won't be my fault at all. It won't be his fault at all if I don't make it. It will be my fault. He gives us what Jesus gives him, and then it is up to us, each and every one of us, to live it. Paul gives, Paul gives all, all that was profitable to the Ephesians. Amen. So now it was up to them to live what he had given them. Amen. And then Paul didn't hide from them this next part. Paul knew that there was something coming. He could feel in the Spirit, and he let them know exactly what was coming. In Acts 20, 22 through 27. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save the Holy Ghost witnessed in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things, they don't move me. Neither count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare in you all the counsel of God. So Paul was saying that he has a warning bell going off in his spirit. He said there's some type of warning bell going off. He had a sense that there was going to be danger, great danger waiting for him when he goes to Jerusalem, and maybe even possibly death. Because in Jerusalem, they didn't like Paul there. No. To them, Paul was what we think of when we think of Judas. To them, he betrayed them. He turned from Judaism and worked hard for them fighting for Judaism. And he turned from Judaism over the Christianity. He was a betrayer of them. The Holy Ghost had witnessed the Paul over and over that if he goes there, there will be danger. There will be great trouble that comes. And if Paul, if he was a lesser man, he would have turned tail. He would ran the opposite direction. 
A lesser man would have tried to find a way to escape this trouble and pretend that the will of God was somewhere else. Paul was not, though, Paul was not looking for an easier way out. Paul wanted to do things God's way. Paul was gripped. He was gripped to his calling. Paul was too gripped to his devotion to Jesus to turn and go the easy way. Paul was not looking for some safe way out through his ministry. Everywhere he had been, he was being told by not people of the world, but people of God, trusted people of God, that it was not safe. But Paul had a calling inside of him. He was not going to turn back now. Amen. That's what Paul could say. But none of these things, none of these things move me. Hallelujah. Paul had his sights. He had his sights set on working for the Lord. Amen. And he's like, I'm not quitting now. No matter what's going on, I'm not quitting. I'm not taking that easy path, that easy road. Paul said it doesn't matter. His call, his call in his life was more important than any danger, any troubles, any trials that was going to come up in his life. That is what we need in our own lives. To stop looking at what we feel the easiest path may be, the easiest road, and look at what, oh, well, that pleases my flesh, but to look at what pleases the Lord. Look at what the will of the Lord is. Not to be moved by the things of this world. All the things of this world get, gets thrown in our face each and every day by all this media and all this junk and get moved by all that stuff that's going on in this world. But to, and that Because all that wants to do is get us off a track of what the most important thing is, and that's to be saved and make it to heaven. It's the most important part. So make sure you're ready. Just like Brother Dwayne talked about on Sunday, make sure you're ready. Because eternity, it only has two choices. There's only two choices. And you know what? You're not promised tomorrow. So any time could be your last time, your last day. Any moment could be. And when your time is up, you can't pick a different choice. It's what you choose now. So you better make your choice and then let none of these things move you. Stay the course. Stay on the path. So then Paul goes on to say, uh, Wherefore I take unto you record this day that I am pure, from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul was saying, I want to go on record. I want to go on record in front of you guys today, you know, because you won't be seeing my face anymore and say, you know what? I didn't hide anything from you. You know, he just talked about this a little bit earlier, but he's going into it again. He wants to let him know, I, you won't see me anymore. I want you to put on record today that I didn't hide anything from the word of God from you. I gave it all to you. I didn't hide the parts that may have been difficult. I didn't hide the parts that might not be easy and the, the ones that might not be easy to eat and digest. He said, I give it all to you. I've given you all that you need, the whole gospel. I've given you everything you need to build on. All the material to build your life on that, that you need to make it to heaven. Now, now it is up to you to take what I've given you Take the words that I've given you. Take all the material, everything that I've given you, and build up your life on that material. Amen. Then spread what I have told you. Give it to others around you. Give it to the people, the lost of this world, to let them know how they can build their life up, to build a life that is pleasing to God, a life that can make it to heaven. Just like we see in the Old Testament, uh, King David he didn't get to build the temple, but you know what he did? He got all the supplies. He got everything ready to build the temple, ready for his son to build the temple. Everything that he needed to make the temple great. And that's what Paul was doing. Paul got everything that he needed. Give him every bit of the word. He said, I didn't hold any of it back. I give you everything that you can do to build your own temple, your own self, to not build a building not think spiritual or uh, physically, but think spiritually and build up yourself, your own temple, giving you what you need. So on that judgment day, when you stand in front of the Lord, that you know that you've done everything to make it to heaven, to hear that great sound of our Savior saying, well done, my good and my faithful servant. So thank you, pastor. Thank you, assistant pastor. Thank you, Sunday school teachers. Thank you, mom. Thank you, dad. Thank you to every single one today that has given me everything that I need to build my life that is pleasing to God. Show me how to be saved. Show me how to walk, how to talk, how to follow that leading of the Holy Ghost in my life. 
thank God. If you need to thank God for people today that God has put in your life to help you build your life pleasing to God. People that didn't hold anything back from you. People that made sure to give you what you needed to make it to heaven. Those that don't hold anything back that may be difficult. Those that didn't just give you the friendly parts that make us feel good about ourselves. Those that don't just tell you God is love. And you know what? God, He's going to give you car, two cars in your garage and feast on your table. But to the people that will give you things that get right down to where we live at in our lives, get into our business, get into our face and show us, you know what? If you're going to live for God, it is going to be real. It is going to be real. It's going to have to come from the heart. God has called you to be a holy person, to be separate from this world. God wants us to live in a way that His Spirit inside of us changes us from the inside out. Amen. And you know what? Those, those are the ones that truly love you. You want to know the ones that truly love you? The ones that will give everything to you. To give you the whole book. Not hold anything back from you. Not leaving out one page of the Bible. The ones that give it to you all. Those are the ones that you know truly love you. And truly care for your soul and where you'll end up at. So Acts 20 and 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So take a look at what Paul is saying here. I, I absolutely love this. He's saying you need to take care of this church. You need to guard this church. You need to watch over this church. Because the church is the only thing that God had to buy. God didn't have to buy planet earth. He just spoke it and it came into existence. God didn't have to buy the moon, the sun, the stars. He spoke a word and it just happened. God didn't have to even buy the animal kingdom. He just spoke and it came into existence. God didn't even have to buy mankind. He formed man from the dust of the ground. The dust that he also created. So God didn't have anything that cost him anything. Nothing cost our God. He is so powerful that whatever he speaks, it has to be done. He speaks and birds fly. He speaks and the fish start to swim around in the ocean. He speaks and planets. Planets just line up in their orbits and they stay there. for. They've been there for thousands of years. All God has to do is speak. And it happened. God didn't have anything that cost him at all, but the church. Amen. Mm. Jesus, the church, it cost him. The church cost our God, and it is important to him. It cost him because his creation, us, mankind, we walked away and we followed the prompting of Satan in our lives. It brought sin into the bloodline of the human race. Because of Adam's sin, our bloodlines have now been tainted with sin. Now, we are all born into sin, but God. Mm, whew, God provided Himself a lamb for the sacrifice. He, Jesus Christ Himself. Mm, yes, Lord. So when Jesus died on that cross on Calvary, and His blood was shed, His blood flowed down and was spilled on the ground that day. That's just not some type of religious story or some type of art that we get to hang inside of our church buildings. That really happened. That really happened. And it was because by one man, one man's sin entered into the world, but by another man, by God in the flesh, now righteousness is available to us all. Godliness is available to us all. And thank the Lord, salvation is available to us all. The church literally, literally cost God His own life's blood. You are in the church that God has purchased with His blood. So with that, you better watch how you treat the church. You better watch how you treat the people of the church because Jesus shed His blood for the church. He bought the church. It cost him something. So don't treat church, even if it's sitting at your own, in your own houses every week, listen to it on the TV. Don't treat church as something as casual. Don't treat church as something just insignificant and small because it cost, it cost our God something. Don't talk about and criticize the church because God 
will protect the church that he shed his blood for. He will protect what cost him something. And I'm not talking about the building, even though the building that we're in, it has been dedicated for us to worship in. So we should treat it as something special. But I'm talking about the people of God. The people of God. Be careful how you treat God's people. Because look at this. The Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. So in my eyes, if you go around accusing your brothers and your sisters, then the word is saying you're just like the devil. That, because that's what the devil does. And if you do what the devil does, you must be one of his and not one of God's. The devil hates the church because the church is so powerful. And that's why he persecutes and hits and beats on the church. Mm. Woo. Thank you, Jesus, God, that you bought the church by your blood, Lord. Woo. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Yes, Acts 20, 29 through 38. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I've coveted no man's silver or gold or peril. Yea, ye yourselves know that with these hands I've ministered unto my own necessities. He was a tent maker. He did his trade and made sure he ministered to his own necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you All things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he knelt down and prayed with them. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all the words which he spake, that they shall see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. So you got to think, this is a grieving congregation. Mm, They're saying goodbye to the pastor. The apostle that had raised up the church, they were saying goodbye because he said, you will never see me again. He was loved. You can see the love of Christ in there. Paul knows that this is the last time that he sees him. So he wants to leave them just like Jesus He wanted to leave them with a warning. He wanted to leave them with words that could help them out. So he said, you need to watch for the dangers around us because there's wolves around us. They'll try to enter in. They'll try to destroy the church. But he said, you also need to watch out for the dangers among us, of our own selves. Every once in a while, there'll be somebody, they'll get some idea in their head, uh, inside of themselves, and they'll rise up and they'll try to bring some false doctrine into the church. He said, you know what? You need to beware of them and watch out for them. If anyone starts talking to you saying, this isn't necessary, this isn't necessary, I don't think we should preach or do that, watch out for them. Or if they use the word, I, I don't think we should be preaching this or preaching that. You need to watch out for those that love to start off with, I think. It's not what I think. It should be what say it does the Bible say. What does the word of God say? Paul said, watch out for this. Be mindful of this. Pay attention to this. Because there are not just dangers around us, but there are dangers among us. We and we need to keep the search, the searchlight. Mm, Excuse me. Mm, Thank you, Jesus. We need to keep the searchlight of the word of God pointed into our own hearts. Because the Bible says, the Bible says this, Jeremiah 17 and 9. This is what the Bible says about our hearts. It says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can even know it? We don't even know what is in our own hearts. So we need to be careful. We we don't even know what's inside there. So we need to be careful. We need to each and every day make sure that there is nothing at all that gets between us and our God. Because we are privileged beyond privilege to be part of the church that cost God something. So 
We owe it to ourselves to watch out and keep guard and stay in the church. So Paul goes on to quote the words of Jesus. He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. But if you look at these words, they're not in any one of the Gospels. None of the Gospels. It is not written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, where Jesus, when he was on this earth, said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So either Paul heard this through someone else telling him when they walked with Jesus, or maybe he got it through some revelation in Jesus. But no matter what, those, that's what Jesus had said. And it may not be in the Gospels, but we can read in the Gospels and read through there and show that Jesus proved it. Amen. Even if we didn't see it written inside there, God proved it. Jesus proved it each and every time with how he walked and how he talked on this earth. He gave so freely all the time. Acts 21, 1 through 7. And it came to pass that after we had gotten from them and had launched, we came straight course unto Cus, And the day followed into Rhodes and into Patera, and finding a ship sailing over from Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. And now we had this, and now we had discovered Cyprus. We left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed in Tyra. For there the ship was to unlaid, unlaid her burden. The ship was going to unload stuff. And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we had departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with their wives and with their children till we were out of the city. And they knelt down on the shore and they prayed. And when we had taken our leave on another, one of another, we took ship and, and they returned home again. And when we had finished our course from Tyra, we walked to um, Telalia, I am probably messed it up, forgive me, and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. Paul had never been to Tyra before, but it says as soon as he got there, he went in search for some disciples. He went looking for some disciples. And when he found them, he stayed with them for seven days. And while Paul was there, they told him over and over and over again, do not go to Jerusalem. God is, he's, the Spirit is telling us, don't go there. There's danger in Jerusalem. Please don't go. And when it was time to leave, they walked with Paul all the way to the boat. They even brought their wives and their children with them. They knelt down and prayed with him before he left. These disciples, they never met Paul before. They'd only spent a week with him, seven days with him, for the first time. But they, but they loved him so much, and they didn't want to see him go. That is the family of God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if you meet somebody in the family of God, you don't have to know him for 20 years to build up a friendship. There's this kindred spirit, this kindred spirit that's there, because there is one spirit that is above us all, through us all, and in us all. There's that kindred spirit and that is the love of Christ flowing through each Amen. and every one of us. So we're about to finish up today. But look, at, but look, Paul's starting to get lots and lots of messages. I'm sure you can see it's getting pretty repetitive here. Everywhere he goes, friends, people are telling him, don't go to Jerusalem. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be dangerous. Paul himself doesn't even know exactly how it's going to turn out. Acts 21, 8 through 12. And the next day, we, there's Luke again, were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And we tarried there many days. There came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Amen. Now, we're, now they're finally getting back, finally getting close to Jerusalem. And it says they enter into Philip's house. Philip, it said, was 
uh, it says there he was part of the seven. That means he was part of those seven deacons that we talked about a lot earlier in the book of Acts. He was the one, if you remember, that went down to Samaria. The revival came forth. And God took him out of a revival to send him down to one man. We've talked so much here recently about helping out one man. He sent him to baptize that Ethiopian eunuch. That was who Philip was. And then here comes another prophet named Agabus. When Agabus got there, he took Paul's girdle, which is what we would call like a belt or sash. It's what they used to tie around, tie around to hold the robe. Then he bound his own hands and feet together with that, tying himself up with Paul's belt. And he goes on to say that the Holy Ghost says that the man that owns this girdle shall be bound in Jerusalem by the Jews and delivered up to the Gentiles. So now you just don't have like these people that he just met telling him. You have people like Luke, one of the writers of the gospel. You've got good men and women like Philip that is telling him, don't go. Don't do it. Please don't go up. Stay away. And you know what? This wasn't a wrong word from God. This wasn't some type of false prophecy. This was true. And Paul, he wasn't a reckless person. He knows how to use his Roman citizenship to get himself out of a jam. There was times that we read when Paul knew it was best to get out of a city, to leave some danger zone so something didn't happen to him. He wasn't a reckless person. But something, something along the way of missionary journey one, two, and three, and now finishing up with three, something must have happened to Paul. You start seeing it later on in his epistles when he writes things like, I might be bound, but the word of God is not bound. And things like when he wrote, many of the brethren have heard about my bonds. And you know what? They've got bolder because they know I'm here in prison serving God. And it made them bolder for Jesus to do great things for Jesus. So Paul knew that even if he went and ended up in prison, even if he ended up beaten, that he might have to suffer days, months, even years, that you know what? It would be worth it all because there are people there that he could preach to that could turn their lives around and they could be changed for all eternity. So if he had to suffer for a season, months, days, years, if he had to suffer for that amount of time, it would be worth it for a soul to spend eternity with yeah. Jesus. That, it, that was just a reasonable risk. It was a reasonable sacrifice for him. If he had to take a bit of danger for people to have their lives changed for eternity, to him, it was an easy choice. It was an acceptable risk. And you know what? Agabus, when he came, it didn't say that he came and forbid Paul to go. The word of God that came was not, don't go, Paul. God didn't tell Paul not to go. It said, if you go, when you go, there's going to be trouble. You're going to walk into danger. You're going to have opposition. You're going to have persecution. But Paul was a man that didn't care about opposition and persecution. He ate him for breakfast every morning. He had one driving passion that, that the world has to know what he knows. That's what drove him. That the world has to know the gospel. That the world has to meet the Jesus that had met him on that road to Damascus and rescued him. He had that burning passion inside. Acts 21, 13 through 14. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and break mine heart? For I'm not ready to be bound only, but I'm also ready to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he could not be persuaded, we cease in saying the will of the Lord, the will of the Lord be done. Why are you breaking my heart? Why are you weeping for me? Why are you Christians carrying on like this, trying to make me feel bad? Because he said, because when I go to Jerusalem, not if I go, but when I go to Jerusalem, I'm ready not to just be bound only. He's saying, you, you, you don't understand here. I'm not ready to just go to prison. I, I'm not ready to just be beat. I'm not just ready for people to speak evil of me and false witness against me. He said, I'm ready to die for the Lord Jesus Christ at Satan. I'm ready to give it all. That Lord Jesus that took me from a path that was leading me straight to hell and he set me on the right path. 
He was saying, why are you crying? Why are you complaining all over me? You don't understand. I'm not ready just to go through opposition and persecution. I'm ready to die for the cause of Jesus Christ. I'm not willing just to give part of my life, but I'm willing to give all of my life. I, I'm not willing, just willing to do a little bit. I'm willing to go all the way. Are we today willing to go all the way for Jesus? To give our all for Jesus? Are we willing to lay it all down for Jesus? Are we even willing to just take the time out every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday to listen to the messages? Are we at least willing to go that far? He was willing to die. How far are we willing to go for God? Because you know what? I just don't want to say I'm a church that has the doctrine of the Bible, the doctrine of the New Testament. But I want to say that I have the New Testament experience, that I had the boldness in my life to live the way the first church lived, to not get so involved in the things of this world and worry like Dwayne was preaching Sunday about all this stuff that's going on around us and fighting for all these different causes of the world, but that I I had the boldness, the desire to live for God, live for Jesus and go and show the world Jesus. Church, it's time to get closer to Jesus. It, it's time to give our all for Jesus. Don't, don't just say that you're in this for the blessings only. I, I love the blessings of God. I love no cancer in the church. I love our travelers being safe and protected. I love our children being safe and protected. But don't be in this just for the blessings of the church. Because you know what? That will only last for a season. But this, but but being this for the good, being this for the bad, being this for everything that comes and know that in the end, it's going to be worth it all. Blessings come, blessings go. You'll get money in your bank account. You'll spend money. Blessings will come, blessings will go. But the choice of eternity is everlasting. There is no change in your mind once you, once you die. There is no saying, well, I want a second chance. It is for eternity. So you better choose wisely now. Don't play this life just safe, but say, I'm going to do the will of God. I am going to do the will of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, for your mercies, God, for your grace, Lord. I thank you, God, for your spirit, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God. I thank you, God, that, you, that the church cost you something, Lord. I know that you can speak things into existence, God, and you spoke great things, wonderful, magnificent things, Lord, but you shed your blood. You gave your own blood for the church, and I thank you for that, Lord. Oh, Maria, Maria. I thank you, God, that you love the enough, God, that you want to see our souls saved, that you give us pastors, God, assistant pastors, men and women of God, to preach the word into us, to hold nothing back from us, Lord, to give us the good, the bad, and the ugly, Lord. Father God, I thank you, God, for the material, God, that you've given me, God, to build my life on that foundation, Lord, that foundation of you, the foundation of truth, Lord. And I praise you, God. I worship you, Lord. I glorify you, God, in the name of Jesus, God. Help your church to read realize, God, what's going on in this world, God, to not be moved, God, by all the things of the world, Lord, but to do, God, what you'd have them to do, God, to draw closer to you, God, to seek after your will, God, seek after your way, God, to strive, God, to get closer to you, God, help us to see, God, what you'd have us to do, help us, God, to be seeking after your will, God, in everything that we go to do, God, yes, Lord, I thank you, Jesus, God, shokor, mario, shokor, mario, Yes, Lord, you are great, God, and greatly to be praised, God. There is no one like you, God, in all the earth, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, in the name of Jesus, God. Woo, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And like always, remember that this Friday night, there'll be another message. And God bless each and every one of you. Continue to look at yourself in the mirror. And, and don't... And don't go easy on yourself. Really search yourself and find where you stand at with God. Because just like Dwayne preached, Brother Dwayne preached on Sunday, eternity, it's forever. Amen. Be where you can hear. Make sure you're at where you can hear God saying your name. Because the time is drawing short. Amen. God bless you.